Hey guys, welcome back to Max TV Original. Today we will be building our own BGA rework station. Don't get scared of once you see this and thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to buy this, it's too expensive, you know, and to build the rest of the station. Uh, there is different options that can minimize your cost. So in my case, I decided to use, we'll start with the bottom preheat section. Uh, now in my case, I'm going to be using this um, Yahoo 853A station but I'm not going to be using all those controls so I'm going to open it up uh, later on the video and I'm going to remove all those controls because they uh, we're not going to be using them they're going to be redundant so all we're using is enclosure and the heating element itself uh, the other option for it is you can get a 500 watt floodlight just like this one you're seeing on the screen right now you can cut it into the bench and that will work just fine for you so that's our heating element. Uh, I'm going to be building, I'm going to have, because we're going to have a top element as well, which I'll go over um, in a second. So what I've done, I've bought another one of those stations, except it's a hot plate one. And I'm going to be using the bottom part and attaching it together. This way I have a space to build the controllers inside, because there is no space inside that one to put a proper controller in. So it'll be a bit taller, but um, it'll be functional. Anyway, so that would be, and I'm also, I will be removing this mechanism and I'm going to be extending those little uh, rods and making a separate table that can be removed out um, from the station so once the board is say disordered you can move the table out and remove the chip instead of you know trying to wiggle something here so anyway so I will be using this for preheating again this is just uh, using the enclosure and the heating element don't worry about the insides they're all going to be gutted out uh, so that's it. I think the other option was infrared heating, but yeah, again, we're trying to make a budget one. Uh, so in my case, this one, you may be wanting to use a um, floodlight, 500 watt floodlight works just fine. So the next step to uh, actually drive it, we're going to be using the solid state relay. This is a standard, oh, I'm not sure what the brand is, SSR 40. Uh, it says it's 40 amps, uh, however, I will not be trusting that with a 40 amps. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely comfortably going to be putting that through this relay or a 500 watt floodlight, that's not a problem, but anything about that, maybe a kilowatt uh, would be all right, but not 40 amps. So standard solid state relay. The next uh, step is the controller, so let's have a look at that. This is a must, uh, there is no other way around it. You could probably build an Arduino, but um, honestly, this is, you, you do, you, you'd want to invest in that. So this is the controller that I'll be using for a bottom preheating section. Uh, it will be controlled by another controller, which will be controlling the top. It's a bit confusing at the moment, but I will ex explain all that. So this controller is uh, very simple to use. It's got, um, it's a P PID controller, or PID controller. Um, the connections on the back are very simple as well. So you've got 240 uh, volt in or 100 to 240, so main, mains in. This is the SSR out. So that goes to your solid state relay. Always pay attention to the polarity. On the other side, we have our um, thermocouple which I will show you in a second, and the alarm output. I will be using alarm, most people ignore it. Uh, it, when the alarm goes off, so what happens is, if the temperature, we set it to 150 and it goes, those, goes on to 160, you can change the settings, uh, the alarm will sound. So in case your relay got stuck or something, you don't wanna you know, have fire, worst case scenario, or you know, destroy your board. So that's what alarm is for, and I will be putting a proper buzzers, very loud, buzzer so it will alert me if the um, something happens here so those controllers it's a uh, rex dash c100 they are very nice controllers um it's yeah that's that's all we need for the bottom and another thing that is they are pricey uh but i decided it's the thermocouple it's a mega k type thermocouple uh, you can get them on eBay, uh, they are $22, each, oh, 22 pounds I think I paid for it each. Uh, they're magnetic, but they are really good. The, why? Is because it comes with this flex cord that, you know, if that's set, you can set it to where your circuit board is and then put a circuit board on top. Or if you're measuring the circuit board, you can easily just press it down and that will sit on top of the circuit board measuring accurately. 
the only thing is I've changed it in the second one. I'll be changing this one as well. So I've taken the plug off. Uh, here's the second one. I've taken the plug plug off because I will be hooking it up directly to the controller. There's no need for the plug. The only thing, another thing about those, uh, the yellow is the positive, the red is negative. I'm not sure why they've done that, but that's uh, that's the way they've done it. So if you hooked it up to your controller and you heat up your thermal couple and suddenly your temperature goes down, that means that you need to swap the polarity, just change it around and try it again and you'll see the thermal couple goes up, the temperature goes up. So also I've taken off that magnet. Uh, those two, um, what seems to be neodymium iron borer magnets, but they are not very strong, I'm not sure. Uh, you can unscrew this, as you can see, it's unscrewable, and pull the wire out, get the plug off, and I've just added a simple nut, because that's going to be mounted into the enclosure of, the, of our BGA station. So that's all you need for preheating. Uh, now let's move on to the next step, which is uh, which is going over the components. So then we're going to have a look at the connections before we start building anything. So that would be the done with the preheating. And now let's have a look at the uh, top heating element. So this is the top heater that I have chosen. Again, this is a pricey thing. It's about $120, $160, depending on where you buy it from and which country. Uh, I've went for this one because it's a lot um, easier for me um, to use that. However, you can make your own. Either you can buy this heating element, they're about 20 bucks on eBay. So just the element itself and uh, it just unclips and it's just a plate and you can build your own metal enclosure if you're handy with metal. Or even uh, if you don't want to buy that, you can make even cheaper one again by using a floodlights. So you can grab four floodlights get the sockets with the tubes uh, with the bulbs out of them and make a metal enclosure with four of those sockets and the halogen tubes are here So you can make a device something like that, just a metal enclosure, also leave some lips and you can cover those sides to give you a window, a square window, so just cover that in metal and this part as well and you will end up with this window that is exposed to bulbs. The bulbs uh, you will need to be connecting, uh, they're 500 watt each, so it will in total be 1 kilowatt and I'll explain why. The bulbs will be connected in series and in parallel. So we'll connect two bulbs like that. This way they're not going to be bright, glowing bright, but they'll be hot enough and those two will connect like that as well. And then those two will be connected in series. Excuse that writing. So like that. And that's our input. So as you can see, this way we will still get one kilowatt instead of two kilowatts because they're 500 each. So it'll be one kilowatt going through this and one kilowatt, uh, 500 watt going through this and 500 watt going through this. Uh, they will be dim, but they will be hot enough. And again, once you close this in the metal, all you'll have is just a bit of a light exposed and you can make a handle or something. And that is works just as good as this heater. So that's another the cheapest option for you. Uh, again, the next step up is just getting that hot plate. And if you're searching, you can search simply for IR650, uh, 6500, and you'll see either those, or you can see the whole stations, but the whole station's gonna cost you know, a couple of grand, or, or you will see replacement elements. So this one is also has a fan in it for cooling, but um, I don't know if it's a necessary thing. Uh, also, you might want to grab one of those plugs. I'm going to change mine to um, four pin, so it's a higher current because that's 450 watts. Again, you will need the thermocouple to drive it or drive that. Uh, sorry, thermocouple SSR. So you need solid state relay to drive the heater, either whichever one, and the thermocouple to control it. So the next step is a controller to control all that, which I'm using this one. Again, this is something you, you want to invest in. 
It is a PC uh, 41, um, a PC 410 by, uh, what's the brand? I forgot the brand. Anyway, they are wildly available. If you just search on eBay for PC 410, you will see tons of those. Just find the cheapest one and uh, they are essential to this project. They are the ones that will control everything. So as you can see, it's got two outs. Out one is going to go to our SSR. Out two is going to go to in parallel, um, or in, sorry, in series with this SSR out. So what happens is when we start that, that will activate this uh, bottom preheat first. So our first stage would be preheating. So once you press start, which is external button, it will kick out out two. And that's when this uh, controller will start heating up the bottom once it reaches a certain time. Uh, it'll go to the next step. So why we're we using this controller specifically, it doesn't just control the temperature, it's got patterns and steps for a profile. As you know, the profiles um, you may have seen with the time and temperature, uh, you have to preheat the station, then you have to wait for it, then you have to heat it a bit more, and then you wait for another uh, soaking period, I think it is. So that's a preheat period, that's a soaking period, and then you got to go up for a soldering period and then down to cooling. I think it's got slow um, slopes, just a bit, and then forced fan slope if you want to cool it down completely. Uh, that would be heating and that's cooling. So that's called a profile. For the different soldering, uh, like sol lead-free solder or leaded solder, you would need different profiles. They change slightly by 10 degrees, but to ensure that you're doing everything correctly, you'd need times, that's, that's the time, and that's the temperature. So that's how you, this machine does the profile for you. So it's going to be fully automated once you press start. It's going to desolder your chip. All you'll have to do is get the table out of there and lift the chip up. And then same when you're soldering it on, you put the chip on, stick it in, press start, and it'll preheat it and solder the chip on. You won't even need to touch the chip. It'll do everything by itself. So that's why this one um, is so... Um, good it's um, actually another thing you can uh, hook up a computer to it through rs232 and watch the thermal profile so this is it for the uh, equipment that we will need to make our own bga station uh, so now let's move on to connections and how i'm going to connect it all together so called schematic not really schematic more of a wiring diagram so let's move on to that so here is the diagram, wiring diagram that I've uh, drawn up for those controllers. Um, let's start with the mains coming in. They're going to through RCBO. Uh, you don't have to use RCBO, you can just use a normal circuit breaker. So I'm using this 10 amp RCBO, which is um, it's a safety, which is JFCI or um, RCD ground fold interrupter. There's different names for them, uh, combined with a circuit breaker. So you still got uh, load and neutral in and um, load neutral out. And that's just for safety. You know, you don't have to use that. You can use just normal circuit breaker. Um, so anyway, and uh, once it's gone through that, we're going to go, uh, let's go over the mains first. So the mains are going to go into the load and neutral of the PC410, which is that controller and then continue on and go into the uh, Rex C100 of a small controller. From there, they also be going, uh, the neutrals goes to both heaters, the upper heater and the lower heater. And the active is going to go to uh, solid state relay, both of them. Then from solid state relays, they're going to go to the heaters. So that's it for the main part. Now let's uh, have a look over the controlling of the SSRs and how they interconnected. So for the lower heater, uh, the power for the negative uh, negative four uh, the SSR for lower heater goes straight to the solid state relay, and the positive goes to the output either A or B doesn't really matter. It's a relay output. From there, it goes to the positive. So now we have the lower heater controlled by the first unit, as in not control the temperature, but controlled whether it's on or off. And for the second one, uh, for the top heater, the uh, output goes straight from pin 4 and 5, straight to the SSR and to the heater. So when we press start, that will allow uh, 
the lower rack C100 to operate the lower heater. If we press stop, the connection between the SSR and um, the rack C100 is broken up by that relay, built-in relay, and the lower heater switches off. Lower thermocouple is connected to the rack C100. The upper heater thermocouple is connected to those pins over PC410. Uh, again, it is uh, strange that those wires are other way around. So yellow is actually positive and red is negative, same as here. So that part is covered. Uh, also, it's optional. You don't have to, but you can connect a COM port to um, uh, PC410. I don't think it does much. I think you can remotely start the unit from the computer and it shows you the graph of the temperature. Pretty sure that's all it does. So also there are uh, two buttons, stop and run. So the stop button is connected, it's a button, push button. It's not latchable, connected to pin 13. Run button is a latchable, connected to, it's a switch, to pin 14, and then they comment with a pin 15. Buzzer, which is an alarm, uh, you don't have to use it, it's optional. Uh, what I've done is I've um, paralleled uh, alarm AB and alarm AB uh, of both units uh, they're working as a relay switch so positive goes to we've got first of all 12 volt power supply again you only need this if you're connecting a light and a buzzer and a fan accessories if you're not using a fan uh, or a buzzer or a light you don't need to worry about that 12 volt supply so anyway we've got 12 volt supply that's going positive to uh, an alarm both of them pin 6 of the rex 100 and pin 11 of pc 410 uh, from there, uh, pin 12, again common together, goes to the buzzer, buzzer and the negative from the power supply goes to the buzzer. buzzer. So w when either alarm is activated, the buzzer will sound. It continues on through the light, uh, through the switch to light, basic. Uh, and another one is going through a, a switch to a fan of upper heater. Again, that's only if you're getting that uh, big unit with a built-in fan. So that's it. It's very simple connection. Uh, now let's... Um, go into the settings of both units. So in this step I have uh, um, already hooked up the Rex C100 to a thermocouple. I've hooked it up to the, I've redone this uh, preheat station, I've gotten rid of electronics inside and I've added a um, solid state relay and there are two red wires here, you can't see them but they're going to the Rex 100. I've got 240 going to Rex 100, I haven't hooked up LAM, and I've got the thermocouple. So the next step, we're going to turn it on and go over the settings. Because that's the first, uh, what we're going to do. So, just uh, enter the settings mode, simply press and hold set. And that's first comes up as an alarm. So that's the alarm setting, how many degrees deviation you would have. So if it goes over 10 degrees of the temperature, it'll set the alarm off. I'll leave it at 10 for now, I might change it later, uh, but I think 10 is plenty. So the next one is Autotune, which we're going to leave off for now. We will get to it in a minute. The next setting is PID, which we will leave for Autotune to determine. AR setting, Integral Overshoot Suppression, which we're going to leave at 80 as per manual. Default, the next one is R, which is the cycle. We're going to leave it at uh, 0, 02. It says 20 here, so we'll leave it at 0, 02. The next one is uh, SC, which is sensor correction value. So I've calibrated my sensor. What you do is um, you uh, get the ice, bottle of a um, small pot, uh, put ice in it, put some clean water in it, um, mix it together, leave it for a while. Then you put the sensor in the water and uh, wait for it to stabilize. Once the temperature on the PV will be stable, uh, and if it says zero, then you don't need to do anything. If it says, say, plus three, which in my case it was, uh, then you said here minus three, which means it's supposed to be zero. That's how you calibrate it. If it says, uh, for example, minus five, then you need to do zero five. So this way it will adjust it to zero degrees. The next set is the uh, lock, which is uh, you don't need to do anything here. This is other way you can lock yourself out of settings. That's going into deeper settings. And uh, that's it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, set it to, uh, we're going to start calibrating. Uh, so we'll go into ARU and uh, this unit is still switched off. 
the power to it. So what I've done is I've got my thermal sensor. Let me just show it to you. And I've added it with the element itself, the thermocouple itself pointing up. So this way it'll touch the board. So I'm going to take the uh, board that is not, it's just a scrap board and I'm going to position it over the top, making sure that the sensor touches the, the board itself. Let me just see. Yep, so the sensor is sitting on the board. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply uh, power to the heating element itself. And that's on and I'm going to turn the auto tune to one, press and hold set again. And now you see the auto tune is starting to flash. And you will see the temperature will start rising. And you do not touch, you leave the auto tune flashing until it stops flashing by itself. So let it do its job. It can take a while uh, for it to do its job. So leave it and it may, or first of all, it'll overshoot the temperature, then it'll undershoot and overshoot again, and it will self balance the unit. So as you can see, temperature started to rise now. So once the light start, stops flashing, then we calibrated this unit to the boards that we're going to be doing. So next time, when you put the fresh board in it that you need to work on and turn the unit on, or we'll turn the machine on, this will automatically know how to heat up the element properly so it doesn't overshoot or undershoot the temperature that was set. So I've set mine to 125 degrees, so the board needs to be at 125. Usually it's 120 to 130, it can be higher sometimes. So 125 is my optional temperature, you may set it 130 if you want to. And I will just wait until it, the 80 will stop flashing. So once that stops flashing, I will come back. It's been now about 10 minutes and as you can see, uh, the screens are now stable and the device has calibrated itself to the temperature. So now every time you turn it on, it'll know exactly how to curve the temperature so it doesn't overshoot or undershoot the temperature. Also, I found another interesting function. Uh, you can quickly access the um, auto-tune mode by pressing the back button and holding it down for three seconds. I don't want to do this now because it's already been calibrated. But if you press it down and hold it for three seconds, you'll see the light will start flashing. So instead of going into menu and changing it, you just simply hold down the second button, which is back, or yeah, and that will um, start auto calibration. Now I am going to install all the buttons and all the controllers in it. So that would be fun. It just fits in there. Yeah. So I'm going to assemble this and hook everything up and then I will be back once I hook up mostly all the parts inside there. So I have uh, almost assembled this uh, part of the preheater which is the base that contains all the electronics and controls so let me just show you around we've got uh, two thermocouples for the lower and upper um, side of the board we've got the front controls here so that's a lower control and the upper control we've got uh, run hold and stop button here so on this side, we've got um, RS-232 port for the upper control. You don't have to put that in, it's just... I had a hole there in the enclosure anyway, so I thought I'll put it in. We've got the lower heater mounted here, on and off button. That is capable of apparently handling 16 amps, but that's way below what we're going to be using. So on the back here, I've got the uh, heater element, and I know that's dodgy. If that's live and you stick your finger in, you're probably gonna get zapped, but um, that's what the original heater comes with. That's the plug on it. Anyway, the light output. Uh, then on this side, we've got RCBO, which is a um, ground fold interrupter and the circuit breaker two in one. IC in and the upper thermocouple. So, I've already tested it quickly. So all those loose wires, those are RS-232. I haven't connected them yet. Uh, that's actually output for the upper heater. And the second one's going to be coming out here, I believe. Yeah, that's two for the upper heater relay. The relay itself is in a unit. Uh, this is for the light. So I haven't insulated the light LED driver yet. It's a low voltage 12 volt LED driver. Uh, one of those little ones, I'll show you. 
uh, those ones. I did have to change uh, 100 micro Henry inductor on it because otherwise they were for higher voltage or something. Uh, the switches are located for the lights and the fan, which is those are for the fan up on the top uh, panel. So uh, that's why the wires are loose. So it's this grounding wire that's all for the top panel. But I will show you the inside. We've got two controllers here. We've got a little buzzer for the alarm on the side there. I don't know if you can see it. It's the, um, the one that doesn't require any control circuitry. It's the one that you apply five volts to it and it screams. RCBO down here. Little 12 volt power supply for the light and the just illumination, the fan and the alarm. And down here we've got the uh, solid state relay for the upper heater. The lower heater solid state relay is in this unit here. So this is the upper unit that I've got here. I've already got it ready to set up. They're going to be sitting on top of each other. Which way? This way around. Just like that. And I've got to screw them in together. I'm going to keep the legs so there's a bit of a spacing for the convectional heating. So it sucks the air in uh, as the hot air rises and cools everything down. Um, that's the two buttons for the light and for the fan. That's what those wires are for. That's the little stickers I've done for the programs. And yeah, as you can see, that would be the upper heater. So that'd go on top of the board. There'll be a separate table that'll go under the board. And here's a light as well. So let me just get the camera a bit higher. I've already tested it, but I will plug it in for you so you can see. Good. So let's power it up. As you can see, the front panels are good and the readers are just by one degree off, but I don't think it, it's that big of a deal. I can recalibrate them. Uh, the light, again, I can turn it on by shooting this wire to positive. And here we have it. So as you can see, the light's working. The run, I've hooked up the LED, that little LED on the controller run. I've actually ran a little wire out and a little transistor and hooked it up to the illumination of that run, uh, run hold button. So when you start it, that LED lights up, as you can see, and if you pause it, it flickers. Uh, the stop LED is wired uh, to alarm, so it'll light up red if the alarm goes off. Yeah, that's loud enough. So that's all working. All right, I'm going to disconnect it and attach the top part, which should be quite easy. Once I've attached the top part, then um, I will show you the assembled unit. So the bracket has finally arrived. Thanks, David, for helping me out with the bracket for this um, top heater. The unit is now completely ready and it's operational. Uh, now let's uh, make a stand for the circuit board, that little table that can be slid into there and test it out on the board. Here are the pieces that I've cut out for our table to hold the circuit board in place. So let's have a look at them. Those two is uh, originally replaced from the ones that were included in that preheater. Uh, they, so it's those ones and those four parts. They already uh, weren't, I already had them. So they usually go down here and um, that forms the circuit board table. However, this is a bit too small, so some, it wouldn't fit motherboard, for example, from a PC into it. So uh, I've decided to make them a lot longer. Those I've got from a hardware store, and you can see they'll be significantly longer run on those tracks. The next step is we're going to have uh, those... Let me get that off. Those things, again, they included in that preheating machine and they're the ones that originally held those little tracks in place. And they are perfect size for the new aluminium tracks that we're going to have, as you can see. Other thing is those little pieces that I've cut up, they are going to be mounted here, probably around here with a screw so they can be rotated. 
Also, there'll be a little screw on the edge here. This will be the part that'll be holding the motherboard. So it'll be just sticking out upwards. And that's when you take the board, you just put it on top of that screw. You can adjust the size, the width, and put the motherboard in the existing screw holes. So there'll be four of those, two on this side and two on that. Now the construction itself of the legs. So I've cut those pieces, those four will be the legs. They're again from a local hardware store, just aluminium. They're quite thick and strong. I'm going to be uh, using those two and one of the long ones like that. So that would form the first part that's going to go, uh, that's going to be actually sideways like that. And the second one's going to be here and the track is going to be across it. And then those two are going to be joining. So if, let me get rid of the legs. If those two are running like that, this will be mounted on top. And then we're going to have those two pieces with the track in them. Yeah, there we go. So that's going to be, and then those uh, panels that hold the circuit board will be gliding across there. Another advantage of using original gear from that uh, preheat station is that those have little ridges, ridges on the side that can hold the board. So if you do have a, some sort of a small board that doesn't have, uh, you know, holes for the mounting screws, you can just slide them together and put the board wedge it in between those two little ridges. I don't know if you can see them right there. So this is the plan. So I'm going now to drill all the holes that required and clean the aluminium. All the parts have been drilled and washed and cleaned. So first step I'm going to do with this is get those PCB holders and put the screws in them. So what I'm going to do is um, Pick the nice looking side, which is this one. I'm going to start threading the screw. Then I'm going to take a Loctite, which is a thread locking fluid. That's the strongest one. I'm going to add it just a drop there. And then I'm going to screw it all the way to the top. There we go. So that's the part where the circuit board is going to sit. So I've got an example here. We got this motherboard and that's going to sit like that. So you can easily attach it to the machine. And then I'm going to attach those assemblies to the main sliding part. So I'm going to again use a Loctite and I'm going to screw that in but I'm not going to tighten it. So once it's going to be screwed in I'll just leave it like that so this can easily rotate. Those brackets have been assembled. I've also put a drop of the Loctite in those holes on the back so this way uh, the screws will sit nicely. And I've added also a little bit of a lubricant around so those can, can pivot around easily. So I don't want to touch it just now because screws are not tight like I said before. They just snug enough for this to be loose. So if I start moving it around now the screws will move and yeah I don't want to do that until the Loctite sets. Once it sets then it'll be easy to move around. So they now I'm going to start assembling the legs so I will use those larger parts, the smaller ones, I'm going to be using those triangles, I've got a bunch of them. And what I'm going to do is, I've already drilled the holes, I'm going to add it in this configuration. Then add that little triangle on both sides, so both sides are drilled. And I'm going to rivet it. You don't have to, you can you know, tap it and use the screws, but I'm going to rivet it. I think rivets will be holding it fine. It'll be eight rivets on each side, so four here and four on the other side. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll be plenty to hold it together. I finished the stents, so they turned out really nice. And the rivets holding the 
corners are actually quite strong and rigid. I'd say rivets are good, better than screws probably. It's very strong, very nice, all straight as you can see. And all the corners turned out to be really good too. So the next uh, one, because those are going to be standing like that. Let me get it in a frame. And across is when we're going to have tracks. So the first part we're going to do is attaching those metal parts across them. You can either do one side, uh, I recommend doing both sides at the same time, so I can't fit it. I can't fit it on the screen. Just. So we're going to have this part. Make sure it's straight. And we're going to tighten one of those with this little thing. Then we're going to insert the track. Then we're going to do the second one and insert the track, so I'll just uh, pre-assemble it so you can see and then I'll line it up off camera. Insert the second track and then before you put the other side you're going to put those rails in. Push them to the sides, push the second one in as well and then add the ends on top and tighten it together with the Loctite. So I'm going to do that off camera because it probably will take a bit of time and I'll come back with the ready table. Loctite is actually set by now and as you can see those are freely rotating and the screws are set in place. So those you can actually adjust to different sizes of motherboards, make them bigger or smaller. The table is now fully assembled and it's nice very strong table too. So let's try putting, I've got this test motherboard again. So let's put it on the table. Again, you can adjust those the way you want. So just point them in the right directions and there we go. So the board is now sitting on the table and it's nice and steady. And that table is gonna go into the machine. So uh, now let's, um, Put, uh, I'll use a different board because this one's already got the chip removed. I'll find another board and we're going to test out the unit itself. So the unit is ready, the table is ready, we're going to test it out. Um, I'll see if the light will actually be probably too bright. So I'll keep the light off. And I've got it set to zero which is the desoldering so I'm going to use a bit of a flux on there. This is the old TV board that is it doesn't work and I'm going to actually run it now so I'll press run and I'm sure you can see the numbers so at the moment there's nothing set so I'll press run and it is starting to run now so it is heating up and now stage five is the final stage so it's going to heat it to two, two. <laughs> So it's going to heat it to 225 degrees um, and hold it there for 40 seconds and the chip should be removed by then. You will not believe it, the memory stick um, on the camera just went full as the step 5 was finishing up. Uh, the chip did come off, uh, not really cleanly, so I may increase the time for a bit longer at that last later stage, but here it is, so it did work. And I'm quite confident that the next uh, job I can do would be the actual uh, circuit board. But that's in a separate video. So let me just change the setting for the bit longer. So I think we had it for 40 seconds. I'll put it for 50 seconds. This is uh, the, the fans running now. You can do the light if you want to see under there. Probably can't see it. But yeah, it did remove the chip. No worries. So let's have a look now at the temperatures that you would need to be setting at the PC4110. I'll make a list and I'll upload it uh, in a link below. Here is an example of patterns for BG Ball Station. Uh, those uh, first pattern zero is 4G soldering the chip. So that's all the sequences. Again, sequence um, one and two is for preheating only. The top element is not used. And sequence three to five is the actual process, the profile. Then uh, sequence six, you just got to select end and hold back is 230. Pattern one is used for leaded 
circuit boards, so which is um, LED. And same thing, the first two patterns is the preheat, the rest of it is the profile. And pattern two is a LED free uh, profile, so again, one and two is preheating, and the rest of them is the profile. So here it is, this is only an example, so you may have to tweak the values depending on what you're doing. If you're using a halogen head, you know, you might want to tweak some values. Just grab a board that is useless board, like I've got this one from TV. Uh, that's where we remove the chip from as a test and just put it on and just experiment with it. Put the chip on, off, remove more chips. Just make sure you're using it as a junk board first. Once you um, confident that your junk board, you, your profiles are correct, then grab something like an old motherboard from a computer and try removing, say, uh, a south bridge from it and putting it back on and see if the motherboard works. Uh, it should if you do everything correctly. Uh, do not go over 200 and uh, maybe 50 degrees because everything will die at this temperature. So don't believe when people tell you, yeah, 300 is all right. It's not. Everything will die at 250 degrees. So do not exceed that temperature. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask me below or comment. Don't forget to like and subscribe. My name is Max. See you next time. Bye.